So good evening, everybody. We are live now. We can go ahead. Over to you, Parag sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome all of you to this uh, next uh, APAS Ortho TV and Sinti Hospital uh, initiative on uh, intracapsular fracture neck femur in elderly. You know, all of us are always faced with this problem when we see fracture neck femurs in our casualty. These are elderly people who just slip and fall. most of them are domestic falls they land in your casualty with the legs externally rotated you instantly know this is a fracture neck femur the question is how do you treat it of course surgically but the options now available today are a total hip replacement the options are a hemi arthroplasty probably cemented or uncemented and this dilemma is always uh, crossing the mind of the surgeon so today we have chosen this topic fracture neck femur in the elderly to clarify some doubts to you know clarify our dilemmas that what is the way ahead which is the best surgery for your patient and this will be brought about in today's uh, webinar we have a very very eminent faculty with us today we have uh, dr sudhir narayan from chennai and he will tell us about the total hip replacement uh, uh which way to go which when can you use cemented uncemented and what is the best indication for a total hip replacement uh, in a fracture neck femur in elderly we also have uh, uh, sanchit mehendra from us from uk bristol and uh, dr sanchit will tell us about hemo hemiarthroplasty when do you go for uh, uncemented option and then we have uh, dr mohanty who will uh, uh, tell us about uh, the cemented option so these are the various talks for today and uh, i welcome our coordinator for today dr sahil sangvi and we have two very very eminent panelists who probably have done the most number of partial hip replacements in this country we have uh, dr pachore sir who is uh, currently in ahmedabad but he is uh, our person maharashtra person <laughs> Uh, mumbai and a sangli person so welcome pachore sir and uh, we also have dr khs who has uh, you know done partial hip replacement in 4 minutes i have seen him putting austin more in literally 4 minutes so with this eminent faculty uh, i welcome all of you and uh, i thank ashok sham for putting this together and over to sahil sir we to take us uh, through this exciting dilemma dr sahil please go ahead thank you sir so i'll start with a short presentation as which will be an overview of the dilemmas that we usually face in management of this entity so i'll just share my screen first yeah. is my screen visible yes very well yeah, yeah. <laughs> so good evening to all our viewers and this will be um, a brief overview on the dilemmas in arthroplasty for femoral neck fractures so femoral neck fractures is a common entity and it's a significant healthcare problem with a high economic burden now fracture neck femur is one surgery where which is done by trauma surgeons and plasty surgeons where you have a lot of trauma surgeons who would be doing only hemi arthroplasty and you'll even have arthroplasty surgeons who will be doing a partial or a total arthroplasty for this entity the worrying thing is that no matter your choice of treatment you have a 25% mortality rate at the end of one year after fracture neck femur in the elderly population so there are certain unique problems in the elderly people they have osteoporotic bone with multiple comorbidities they have a poor ambulatory status and are often already using walking aids the recovery post operatively can be delayed sometimes with other issues which are medical like electrolyte imbalance delirium and other consequences there is a high incidence of free falls in these patients and higher dislocation rates so when you have a patient in front of you one thing you would want to avoid for sure is a revision surgery and you want to try and minimize your mortality rate as much as possible now what makes the indian scenario unique is that india is currently in a phase of demographic transition there is a high prevalence of osteoporosis and an aging population so this is our census data and the projected increase up to 2050 so the last census in 2011 we had a population over 60 of 104 million 
Now, in just another six years, this is postulated to rise to 173 million, and by 2050, it is said that people above 60 in India would be 324 million. So, by 2050, one fifth of our population is going to be elderly, and India has thus acquired the label of an aging nation, which puts this topic in an even um, more significant aspect. So in 2030, the only 12.5 percent of our population will be above 60, but by 2050, as I mentioned, this was the United Nations Population Fund study, which says that 20 percent, that is one fifth of our population, is going to be elderly. So what are the choice of treatment you have in front of you? So patients less than 60, we would usually opt for internal fixation, which is fair enough. More than seventy-five, most of us would probably agree on an hemiarthroplasty in patients above seventy-five or even eighty. But the first dilemma, which starts, is in a patient with sixty to seventy-five, what would you do? Would you go in for a total hip or a hemiarthroplasty? So, if you consider this case scenario of a sixty-eight-year-old gentleman with a fractured neck femur, would you do a total hip replacement or a partial hip replacement? Would you go for total hip replacement? Then, what would be your bearing of choice? ceramic on poly would obviously be better but would you probably consider even metal on poly if you want to do a partial hip replacement is it unipolar versus bipolar and would your stem be cemented or uncemented so when we consider total hip or hemiarthroplasty we probably consider the following five six points so we consider the age and the comorbidity status of the patient his ambulatory status and is he using any walking aids more importantly what is the cognitive status of the patient and the functional demands and do they have family support or are they living independently and another important aspect in our country is the cost scenario there's a lot of cost constraint on these patients many a times which again influences our decision making one thing we know is that dislocation rates in general are higher following arthroplasty for femoral neck fractures compared to other indications like avn the rates of dislocation are more following total hip rather than hemi so what would you do if you are doing a total hip would you do a elevated liner is there an indication for dual mobility to reduce your dislocation rates other indications or other issues that crop up are that of acetabular erosion and protrusion with a hemi arthroplasty but in literature yet there is no evidence of superiority between a total and a hemi so the longevity of hemi puts the patient again with an increased risk of revision in the choice between unipolar and bipolar we often know that bipolar will give better function and range of motion with reduced acetabular erosion but again there are some papers which say that after a period of time bipolar would eventually function as a unipolar and this is again disputed if you see this paper where they compared unipolar versus bipolar they make a strong statement which says that the now outdated austin moor prosthesis but again i don't think this is very applicable to india where again in very many peripheral places and government hospitals again because of cost constraints a lot of us are still doing austin moor prosthesis so what is the downside of this and should we be doing it or not between unipolar and bipolar again literature is divided where they could not decrease the incidence of acetabular erosion in the long term with bipolar and another paper which had 30000 patients said that there is no significant difference between these two in cemented and uncemented a traditional teaching is to go by the door classification where in type a and type b we would probably prefer an uncemented but in type c we would go in for a cemented but in hemiarthroplasty there is a slightly different aspect that we would like to consider cemented we know has a longer operating time and with cardiopulmonary issues could have a higher mortality rate which is again disputed uncemented there is a higher risk of periprosthetic fractures both intraoperative and postoperative with subsidence and thigh pain being another issue but there are other determinants like mortality rates infection implant survivorship revision rates and clinical outcomes which is again not known so in cemented versus uncemented usually these four questions crop up are the mortality rates that is perioperative and postoperative different what are the revision rates what are the complication rates and lastly do the clinical outcomes vary in these two groups 
again there is a bias because of an inherent preference where usually the results of cemented stems in the us have often been poor because there is an inherent preference for uncemented stems whereas the results of stems used in europe have been good and again when you compare registry data this bias crops up because in europe cemented stems have tended to achieve better results rather than cementless stems and this is the data from the american joint replacement registry where if you see even in 2019 for total hip replacement only 15% of the stems were being cemented but when you consider hemiarthroplasty this number goes up to about 45% data is again partially favoring cemented arthroplasty because of a lower risk of intraoperative and periprosthetic fractures and again cemented stems result in fewer implant related complications and probably similar mortality rates so again literature does not give you any conclusive evidence so through this webinar what we aim to deliver is to probably have a consensus in decision making with regards to total versus hemi bearing surface for total hip replacement when should you do a cemented or an uncemented stem and is there still a place for unipolar as compared to bipolar thank you so i'll now request um, suri sir to start with his presentation on total hip replacement for arthroplasty in neck femur fractures in the elderly Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sahil. Thanks, Parag, Dr. Sanchethi, everybody, for just asking me to share my thoughts on the subject. Uh, I think Sahil has very comprehensively discussed the basic issues that constantly play in our mind when we are having this day-to-day -day problem of uh, hemi fractures in the emergencies uh, that come up to us. Uh, but what you find normally is that uh, when we the challenge uh, oftentimes is never the surgery it's predominantly a matter of decision making and weaving our way through various comorbidities as you very rightly mentioned with regard to the age you find that we find more and more elder people today to have three neck femurs on a day beyond 80 and 85 years old is not surprising they have the cardiac issues uh, they are on the blood thinners there are very many issues so the comorbidities play a great part in balancing and getting a successful outcome besides of course the local situations of bone quality the functional levels and one other important aspect we need to really put our minds to is what is the length of projected survival of the patients beyond i mean that is basically some rough estimate if we have that also helps us in the decision making what, what to do mental agility of course is extremely important because senile dementia sets in the parkinson sets in and other issues and it is probably very important for us to anticipate all the issues before we do finally when you elect for some reason one you know, whether it's a total or a partial like dr parag mentioned surgeon experience plays also a very crucial part and this has also been seen in some of the large volume centers that the faster you do the more precise you do the lesser are the complications down the line over the period of time hemiarthroplasty is unipolar to bipolar has sort of evolved certainly over the period of time from the austin moors we've got the cemented thompsons we progress to bipolars uh, and the bipolars uh, also we have variety of uh, options cemented to non cemented which are part of the discussion this afternoon so i think this has significantly evolved uh, to the point that today if you look at a bipolar hemi arthroplasty for a trauma the stems and the way you do it almost is like a total hip minus the socket you can whatever you do cemented a well done cemented or uncemented you have the modularity you got a better, better surface finish also the head component of the uh, 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 the uh, system is now available in a millimeter increment this was a deficiency at one time when we had 2 millimeter increments especially with austin moore thompsons so coapting the socket with the head was always not appropriate less so you tended to oversize sometimes sometimes undersizing both had its own consequences but for some reason by chance you got it right you got it right and this patient used to survive extremely well for a long time so the better restoration of offsets it almost is appearing appears as if it's a large head total hip 
which makes up for the fact that you have a bipolar head and not a, a head in this. But the only downside when you do the hemiarthroplasty, we consider in these situations is the interface friction. You are putting metal against the cartilage, and that has been the concern over a longer period of time when you sort of assess these patients over the later period of time. So fractures in the, if bipolars are so good, then why do we even talk about or consider total hip? One reason I think there has been a sort of a slow shift, more sort of a Western influence, especially the American literature to go towards a hip, not unjustified at times, but then what you find in the multiple publications that come in now is that there are more and more papers talking about the favorable outcomes with total hip. So that is what I think we need to debate very seriously. Is it, is it uh, required or are the results with the hemi as good as the total hips? So one point that can be some point which could debate with regard to total hip versus uh, a hemi replacement is again the survival data of these patients, function and performance. I think it's an important aspect one we could discuss on these things. Are the complications of hemi or accommodation to the patient's function better with the total than the hemi? I think it is a question mark. I think we don't still have very clear affirmative sort of answer when we scan through the large literatures over extended time. Restoration of hip mechanics today, I think is a non-issue in both sides. You can probably create the appropriate offsets and that soft tissue balance required. Metabolic bone issues with the time-related changes will prevail and that will be a factor again we will need to consider where in some special situations, this pendulum may swing towards a total than the partial, basically, like I mentioned, because of the interface issues. So I think though, I would like to probably go in into some discussion upon the long-term survival, some data that has been published that makes sense to us, whether we can take some lessons out of this, also with regard to the functions, what is the status. So look at the long-term outcomes of hemi replacement. I'll give you the total hip replacement the outcomes we know that is well established. I don't think there is anything much to point at it. The question always comes, you need to do the hemi replacement, what are the things? A natural history of hemi arthroplasty for the displaced fractures seen as a linear study on a long from 1975 to 1889, and they have been followed up to almost about the 2013 when it was finally published. And they looked at two endpoints, uh, annual uh, uh, follow up till the death or a revision. Remember, most of these patients, 50% survival will be very less. One year mortality, if you see 28%. Five-year mortality is 63%. So you would probably at the end of beyond five to eight years, the number of possibly the survival status will be around 50 to 60 patients. That's all. That itself is a big thing we'll need to put our eyes open on. Revision in this case was found to be pretty low, only about 16% of these cases. But in short, what was the final observation in this long study was males less, less than 75 years had a slightly higher possibility of a revision more than 75 years, probably it is a much safer procedure. I don't think there is a big dispute about it. A hemiarthroplasty works extremely well. This was again from the Exeter Center, a five to 13 year study with the cemented Exeters. I think the cemented outcomes have some of them have been the best from the Exeter or from the Wrightington groups. And in, in that line, I think it was expected that the stents are not going to work badly. They are going to work well. But the bipolar survival data of 60%, they had no revisions of whatsoever over 11 year period. So in short that it had worked pretty much well, but there was, uh, again, the age related thing was an average age of about 71, maybe a little less than the median age reported in most other studies in this case. Uh, this is a third study, which is Dan Berry and uh, Hidakovich had published in 2003, much earlier. They looked at the cases done, the conventional sort of a hemiarthroplasties probably predominantly unipolar and then bipolar, 76 to 85. The mean age, if you look at is 79 years, all of them were hemiarthroplasties. And the mean follow-up of surviving patients at the time of publication in 2002 was 11 years, five to 16. And for the entire group, they had a 19 year study. And if you look at again, the survivorship, it was pretty extremely good. Reoperation for no reoperation for any reason, socket or a separate fine. The results were almost 95% survival. So overall opinion of the Mayo group at this time was that a cemented bipolar arthroplasty for arth acute femoral neck fractures is, has an excellent component survivorship. The complication rate is low, the revision rate is much less. So I think there is enough data even with the conventional hemiarthroplasties that the results have been good and results have, they have served well to the elderly patients. This was again from William McCauley 
which is a much earlier, 96 to 2013, with a minimum two-year two follow-up on 686 cases, they found the overall revision rate was only 5.6. So oftentimes the concern comes whether there's going to be a protrusio because of the hemis or whether there's going to be a loosening of the stem. It doesn't seem to be reflecting in large meta-studies. And the meta-analytical studies, again, they show a pretty low rate. Conversion rate in more than 75, always like we have seen in the earlier studies, is less than the 75. So probably the zone of debate or zone of contention for total hip probably falls around the younger people a little more. In terms of function and performance, how does the uh, total hip stand with regard to the unipolar activities? Uh, this is again a meta-analytical study of 20 publications that balancedly compared both the total hip versus the hemiarthroplasties. Uh, and overall risk of dislocation, even though it was higher in the total hip, it seemed to more be more than offset by the fact that the THA total hip seemed to be functionally much superior to hemi in this experience, especially if the life expectancy is more than at least five years at the time of injury, they, uh, they, this uh, suggestion from this meta study was to consider a total hip irrespective of the age. But if the patient is older than 80 with a shorter expectancy, hemis should serve them as good. So again, we are in a balanced territory. We don't get so great information besides the fact that probably less than 75 or 70, and physiologically they're active, considered probably a total hip. So in a look at outcome of hemiarthroplasty and total replacement in elderly patients, meta-analysis of age studies, again, the sort of a predominance and preponderance was towards a total hip. These are all the latest studies you find more and more people talking about the total hip having a better function and a better uh, thing. And uh, that's why probably a selection of appropriate total hip in most situations probably would be good. This again, like another comparison study revealed for them no big significant difference, both in terms of survival and in terms of function. Whether you are cementless or a cemented, I think the results more or less seem to, seem to be the same. So again, here, based upon a sort of a not so very clear outcomes, they said total hip is a preferred surgical technique. We displaced fractures with low morbidities, which we could presume that they were probably on the younger side. So it is basically a functional status before the injury, probably that also had a great influence on the decision making with regard to whether total hip was good in the later times. What was also seen in the very high volume centers, the outcomes in total hips seemed to be better, probably because the selection criteria were more stringent, the surgeons were highly experienced, the time of surgery was much better, the component positioning and placement was good. Probably all this contributed to a better outcomes in the high volume centers compared to the smaller places where they did lesser number of cases. So the question now comes, when is total hip recommended? I think uh, it is very, very clear in certain scene. In carefully, you have to select the patients very carefully if you are contemplating on a total hip for a neck femoral fracture. That hip has to improve a, considerably offer better improvement in terms of the quality of life. So you have a normal cognitive individual and this chart, which I borrowed from one of the, this publication was pretty much very straightforward. It says healthy, independent individuals, a fair life expectancy, active lifestyle, and not too very obese, I think, who are independent, I think go ahead for a total hip. In all the other cases, I think hemiarthroplasty would, would work equally well. And again, who would get another sort of a surrogate way of deciding was the preoperative uh, uh, ability of the patient. It is the Nottingham hip score along with the nice criteria. You can add this. And if you find that they are actively eligible within this range, probably they would do better off with the total hip than probably a partial. Basically because we're expecting a high longer longevity and longer degree of functional activities and the stress on the hip joints. Our own um, publication from India, the last one, which I want to allude to was from Dr. Maria in 2006, where he, if you see their range, they again tended towards more total hips as the age came down. At 85, it was predominantly 40 uh, bipolars. As the ages came down, it was more pre uh, preference towards the total hip. Uh, there was no much elaborate uh, discussion upon the functional outcomes in this case, but the fact that comorbidity is more than five, then the revision rates and survival was much more, much less as expected. So I think consider total hip if the person is physiologically active, better ASA grade, 
that is lesser complications and lesser comorbidities a very motivated individual who is raring to go i think is a very very important sign we should keep in mind less than 75 years and the expectancy is more than 75 to 80 years of survival you could well consider a total hip or a well done hip but probably that is a justification for a total surgery experience and expertise in executing the procedure is also very crucial to avoid procedure related failures and in our country i think we cannot discount the fact that we also need to keep the economic issues in mind and in that regard if you can give the same result with the hemi i think probably you will sit for the fee there are of course certain special situations where we will need to consider and in uh, a total and not a partial when your socket cartilage is suspect like for example post polio sometimes some of these cases or a thing neglected polio situations you find the cartilage is not very great extremely soft some amount of areas of patchy chondrolysis probably you are better off with a, a total hip but in this case of course we are more in, uh, emerging with this basically because the dual mobility possibility otherwise the small size and dislocation would still be a big concern osteosclerotic conditions when the things are very bad again you don't have hardly have any cartilage when you open these cases and trying to put a hemi replacement against a sclerotic acetabulum is not a big uh, good idea totally probably is the way to go when people are with the fractured neck and they present you extremely late 6 to 8 months you find there is already secondary chondrolysis and secondary changes that happens in the socket and you are not having a good assessment do not put a hemi i think probably you are better off putting a total again in this situation so basically it's all pathological cartilages that you find and in secondary pathological fractures secondary involved i think you must do a ct see the supra acetabular area if there is involvement of osteolytic cavities again totally probably is the way to go but whatever you do if you do the total hip so first per operatively i think there are certain important criteria you must keep, uh, keep in mind your restorational joint the, there is always a concern of limb lengthening when you do the hemi replacement or when you do the hip replacements in trauma in hip or total so i think be doubly aware of the fact because that could be a nagging problem so restoration of the lengths and the offset is very crucial all this rotate and because the tissues are lax we tend to lengthen it basically because you want there is no need to get a very tight hip if the components are in good appropriate position and appropriate inclination i think you should be able to put the tissues back to where they belong and if you have the capsule and the rotators restored to their normal positions with a normal length i think you are assured of a good function so i think special attention should be drawn to this point with regard to cemented versus cementless i think the results and the literature shows good if you do a proper cementation on the cemented stem they should work equally well should not be a problem bones very soft osteopenic doubtful i think cemented is a better choice uh, but in other situations you could go for a well if you do a non cemented i think the only one point you should keep in mind is the metaphyseal bone morphology and you should have the appropriate design of the stem if you do not and if you do not have a rotational stability i think go switch to cemented that will probably give you a more predictable outcome in these cases like dr sahil mentioned with regard to the uh, uh, tribological choices i think met uh, hard on plastic soft is a way to go and probably one could get either a metal on plastic could work well or a oxygenium on uh, plastic whichever is good depending upon what the patient is able to afford that should be a choice which is good in terms of approach anterior probably has a better mention with regard to redislocations but if you are good with the posterior i'm sure today with the proper approach proper closure you could get equally a good result also the feasibility is possible that when you do a trauma you could still retain the piriformis and then continue and do your total hip that will be an added sort of protection that will prevent you from changing the offsets in these cases so i think uh, in, uh, to, uh, there is a literature seems to show a slightly increased uh, tendency towards the total hip with the expected gains predominantly in the function known long term outcomes of the total hip and uh, the lesser concerns of erosion of acetabulum or the protrusion but remember the downside is the operative time and it's going to take its time the dislocation concern will exist the medical co uh, morbidities and of course the cost factor is you will have to weigh these negative options against the positive beneficial aspects of this the prime considerations when we decide should still rest on the age the functional status the cognitive scores we have and the life expectancy and the comorbidities of this patient 
and so finally often it will be a judgmental call from we as surgeons to look at the patient study these issues and decide what probably is appropriate so total hip in fractures i think uh, cemented the issues are there cemented or uncemented this answer is equivocal like i said when in doubt cemented has worked equally well there is no overwhelming evidence for one over the other is the same with the approach if you are an anterior approach person i think uh, proceed with that i think that's better in terms because the posterior tissues are not touched large uh, large heads are preferable when you are doing it in today's situation to minimize and offset the dislocation i think uh, restore the offset and large head probably is a better choice appropriate capsular closure for the posterior surgeons is very crucial be aware of the lengthening which often we find in the post trauma situations you have to take be doubly aware of it and take care for this uh, and the component alignments special focus so that we minimize these dislocations in these cases so the decision making in the social context which probably is very pertinent in our society to the end is i think we can't probably borrow the entire western data and the western approaches in india i think we have another set of issues another set of problems philosophies the cultures the living and the way we live the social necessities i think will play a part often what i usually like to call as a social estrogen in a sense that you know there are a lot of independent single individuals in the elderly who live in elderly old care homes in abroad in the western cultures they are not without any much support and that's why you find a monday morning a higher incidence of fractures dropping by because towards the weekend they had a fall but in india if you see most quite often in most places the elderly are taken care of by the joint family or the next siblings and so they always have the support and probably this also helps in a great deal that they can be protected and this factor again needs to be factored when we finally make a decision make thank you very much for this thank you suri sir for the wonderful talk next we will proceed with our debate between cemented and uncemented hemiarthroplasty First, I'd like to request Dr. Sanjit Mandrele to start with his talk for cemented hemiarthroplasty in neck femur fractures. You'll have to unmute, sir. Good evening, KJ sir, KJ sir, Parag sir, and uh, Dr. Sahil. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to pre present a. Uh, the uk perspective sorry i can um on hemiarthroplasties in the fractured neck of femur in the elderly population now in the uk there's as was mentioned uh, by dr suri in his comprehensive talk about total hip replacements and hemiarthroplasties there's a big bias towards cemented fixation and over the next 10 minutes or so i'm hoping to convince the rest of you to go cemented as the way forward So, as has been covered early on, indications: um, intracapsular fracture neck of femur with an intact acetabulum, by and far. The contraindications tend to be a pathological fracture, where there's some pre-existing hip pathology, and failure of internal fixation devices. Okay, in some cases of the failure of internal fixation devices, it's still possible to put a hemiarthroplasty. As we have heard, young patients probably not the best candidates because the patients will outlive the implant and those are the cases where you'll think have to think about revision surgery okay the next point to make is that we are going to talk about the modern stems here not the ones that we used to use conventionally uh, and again this is a very western perspective on things so we are talking about the stainless steel double tapered collarless polished models uh, which may be unipolar or bipolar uh, but they have been tested in terms of their longevity so i put it to you cemented hemiarthroplasty the advantages are reliable primary fixation they're entirely predictable and i know kejas sir i've seen him do it in uh, austin moves in very quick time but for the average surgeon a cemented hemiarthroplasty should be done within 45 minutes okay in any setup in any circumstances whether the patient is so by and far it's a very predictable set of operations there is a very low risk of intraoperative and postoperative fractures the function is arguably better and cemented arthroplasties are cheaper okay i don't have to think about the door type of femur because cement will sort everything out over the next 
a few slides. I'm going to go through the literature and hopefully it will be a journey from about 2011 to the most recent literature. So uh, Suri sir talked about total versus hemiaplasty, and this was the National Hip Fracture Database based studies. So big numbers. So total replacement versus hemiaplasty, 3,800 plus patients in each group at 18 months and four year follow-up. And again, bear in mind, there is, this is a slightly earlier study, so 2013. So the dislocation rate was higher at about 2.5% versus a hemiarthroplasty, but the revision rates were actually identical. So even if you put a hemiarthroplasty in these patients, the revisions, you did not have a whole scale rise in the revision rate. Now, why put cemented hemiarthroplasty? So again, Jameson's work, this is based again on the hip fracture database, 60,000 plus matched patients. So about 30,000 in each group. And the cementless group had a higher revision rate at 18 months, a higher revision rate at four years, a higher 30 day chest infection rate. There was no other difference in the reoperation or any other medical complications. And the lower rate of dislocation at four years, this was the interesting one that Normally, you would expect the rate of dislocation to be less in cemented implants, but this was what was picked up in the cementless group on this occasion. We then move on to 2014. Again, what you will find is that, as was pointed out by Dr. Sahil, that hip fractures have a high mortality. So long-term follow-up is sometimes tricky. So you will see that in all the literature, the randomized control trials are of smaller numbers, and the wider implications are, or wider conclusions are based on registry data. So you have this study where 200 plus bipolar hemiarthroplasty with a five year follow up, the Harris hip score was better for uncemented hip replacements, but the lower periprosthetic fractures were seen in the cemented group. As regards mortality, dislocations, infections, there was no difference. Okay. On the same theme, 200 patients, one year follow up, okay. So cemented hemiarthroplasties had less local major complications, no difference in operative time, no difference in functional scores. The argument always put forward against cemented implants is the operative time, blood loss, and sort of cardiovascular complications. It is not borne out in a significant proportion of the studies. We are moving towards further to the more current literature, so 2017. We go on to the current generation stems, so the GRI stems, the Exeter stems that were talked about earlier. So metrianalysis, this was a Dutch study where three times the high incidence of implant related complications when you use a cementless implant. There, were no, there was no difference in local or general complications, no difference in mortality, and there was no difference when it came to cardiovascular complications. So the bone cement implantation syndrome side of things, drop in blood pressure, mortality, not borne out in these studies. We go on to this study from China where they did a meta-analysis of randomized control trials. Now, bear in mind, they started off with about 800 plus studies. By the time they whittled down the criteria, it was about seven or eight studies. And again, that gives you an idea of long-term follow-up of these patients is very tricky because of senile dementia, because of high mortality rates. But again, in this group, at cemented hemiarthroplasties across the board, better post-operative function at one year, less incidence of intraoperative and postoperative fractures. Again, this is a theme that keeps on throughout the literature about cemented hip replacements. The operation time was longer, but in across this literature, it was only about 10 minutes longer. And we have to talk about average surgeon rather than specialist surgeons. There was no difference in the Harris hip score, no difference in mortality or complications. We go on to Martin Parker, big name in hip fracture surgery, certainly in the UK and across the world as well. So randomized control trial published this year, one year follow-up of 400 cases, cemented versus uncemented. And the uncemented stems, interestingly on this occasion, had a slight tendency to higher mortality. There was no difference in pain relief, no difference in the revision or reoperation rates. It also showed that there was a poorer recovery in mobility with a higher incidence of fractures. So this intraoperative and postoperative fractures keeps coming through. Interestingly, the perioperative deaths tended to be lower when the uncemented stems were used, but at the one year follow-up, there was no difference. Norwegian hip fracture registry. So 11,000 plus cases, cementless versus cemented. Again, the same conclusions, higher overall risk of revision, higher risk of fractures, 
no difference in mortality or pain or quality of life. So again, the criticism about cemented stems that higher mortality is not really borne out in the literature. We go to the reoperation side of things. Again, borrowing data from the Norwegian hip registry, 11,000 plus hemiarthroplasties, lower reoperation rate, less fractures, less hematoma. I said about hemiarthroplasties when they're cemented being entirely predictable. So less aseptic loosening. Don't have to worry about the shape of the femur. It will fit, it will be very easily doable. However, they did point out to a slightly high incidence of intraoperative complications, including that, and that sort of is the bone cement implantation syndrome, which there are various strategies and can easily be avoided. Dr. Suri pointed this study out, the American study from New York, 686 patients with two year follow-up, low rate of conversion above 75 years. And that seems to be the cutoff that above 75 years, a hemiarthroplasty will work absolutely fine. What was interesting about this study is that there were higher dislocation rates with the bipolar hemiarthroplasty, which is actually counterintuitive. There were lower rates of fractures in cemented stems, no surprises there, but no advantage of unipolar versus bipolar either. Okay. Mortality is one thing that's always thrown against a cemented hemiarthroplasty. And the top two studies, again, literature-based studies, the top one from Canada, the one below from the Dutch registry, no difference in mortality and revision rate. If anything, it favored doing a cemented hemiarthroplasty. The last paper I've put in there is actually related to osteoarthritis. The only reason I've put it there is if bone cement implantation syndrome is such a big factor, it would have applied in the arthritic patient population as well, although admittedly they're not as frail and elderly as we would have our fractionic of femur population. And in the UK, certainly, or England and Wales, this changed everything. So National Institute of Clinical Excellence Guidelines, um, CG124, which was published in 2011, and that's why I've sort of touched on the literature from 2012 onwards, because there's a comprehensive literature search prior to that, which showed that a proven femoral stem design, rather than Austin Moore Thompson's, works better, use cemented implants in patients undergoing surgery with arthroplasty, and then replacement, i.e. a total replacement, if there was no cognitive impairment, the patients were fit and active um, and had a displaced intracapsular fraction of femur. And that has had a big impact on what we do. And this is the National Hip Fracture Database study. And what thankfully you'll see is the cemented arthroplasties, hemiarthroplasties are going up. That's the green arrow, uh, green dots going across. What was pointed out in the discussion earlier is that the total hip replacements did have a peak and they varied about between the 25 and 50% mark. So these are patients who, according to the NICE criteria, would be eligible for a total hip replacement, but only about 25 to 50% of these actually got a total hip replacement. Despite that, and despite a significant proportion of those patients getting a hemiarthroplasty, we haven't seen a corresponding increase in the revision rates, i.e. the cemented hemiarthroplasties work well. This is the Bristol data. So again, 100% cemented arthroplasties and uh, we have two hospitals, so the Bristol Royal Infirmary, 100% cemented. And again, you'll see that the total of replacements had a peak early on after the NICE criteria were introduced. And now it's kind of plateaued to between 25 and 50%. <laughs> the second hospital, again, 100% for cemented and then a brief rise and then plateauing for the total of replacements. Borne out in some of the registry stuff, so Australian New Zealand registry, they stopped short of recommending a, femoral, a cemented femoral stem as their standard, but they still suggested using a femoral stem design other than Austin Moore Thompson's. But look at their data. When you see the data, overwhelming proportion of cemented hemiarthroplasties. Okay, so that seems to be the way forward and across the board. This is the Scottish hip fracture audit. Again, data from 2008, but this is the most recent report. And again, cemented hemiarthroplasty works well. It has a significant usage across the hospitals. Same thing transported through the Irish hip fracture database. Okay, slightly lower numbers, but still 76% cemented hip replacements. Look at the National Hip Fracture Database usage of implants. The top 10 implants are all cemented. And thankfully, it's a significant proportion of hospitals using that as their standard implant. Small proportion of uncemented hip replacements down the end. And again, we'll come to the cost factor in that. This is the cost. I said it was cheap. Look at the cost of the exit trauma stem, the mean being 277. People tell me that, oh, when you add the cost of cement, the cost increase. 
40 quid for one pack of cement, two packs of cement for a hemiarthroplasty, and it will still take you to about 350 pounds. Cost was mentioned, and again, any of the hemiarthroplasties which are cemented would always cost lower because they don't have the coating, they don't have any of that sort, barring, of course, the Austin Moore prosthesis. In summary, I put it to you, the question shouldn't be whether it's cemented or uncemented. The question really should be, why not cemented? And every patient gets a cemented hemiarthroplasty. It is safe, it is predictable, it is reliable, it has a low complication rate, and essentially you get a low cost, low cost cheap custom stem. You can sink it, you can leave it proud, you can do whatever with it. Functional outcomes are better. The only thing to watch out for is bone cement implantation syndrome, which in about 1% can be quite significant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sanchit. I think there was overwhelming data in support of cemented. So now let us see what Dr. Mohanty has to say in favor of uncemented stems. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sahil. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Very good evening, dear friends. Uh, first of all, let me extend my gratitude to Dr. Parag Sanchiti and uh, Dr. Sahil for inviting me to this webinar. Uh, I don't know why, you know, what inspired Dr. Parag, our uh, past president of Asia Pacific Arthroplasty Society and Dr. Sahil to set up this, uh, you know, fighting between uh, Sanchit and me on this Saturday evening. But definitely it is not a healthy practice during a pandemic that to not wearing a mask. But again, on the contrary, we are fortunate enough to fight on the virtual platform and hence we don't require a mask. Friends, I'm going for on cementless hemiarthroplasty in elderly. I have a disclaimer here. I do uncemented hemis in selected cases, be it be a, in a fully coated uncemented prosthesis or be it be a fully uncoated the old Austin Moore prosthesis and this is a X-ray which I'm showing of my own grandmother whom I operated in 2003, which lasted almost you know, 10 years before she passed away in 2013. Now the question here, what is elderly? You know, a person aged 65 years or more is often referred to elderly by WHO and various literatures. But if you see the life expectancy in 2020, in our country, it is almost 70 years, whereas a country where Sanchit lives is uh, almost 81 to 82 years. And you see these are various you know, life expectancy in other nations. And especially when we are considering Asia Pacific region, the life expectancy varies from 72 till 84, 85 years. So what we are looking at, a, you know, a single surgery without any failure, without any complications, which would last for about say 15 years or so. Now, as Sanchit told you that money matters. Yes, money matters more so for our country itself. And if you see the you know, difference between cemented and cementless stem in our country, it is hardly any difference, just a $50 difference. When you consider cementless stem only, it is only the stem. But whereas you, when you consider cemented stem, it is always associated with two packets of you know, antibiotic impregnated cement, gun, syringe, centralizer, end cap, canal restrictor, blah, 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 to have a good cementing technique in order to have a you know good long term outcome of these processes so if you add the cost to all this to cemented stem then the cost of this stem is almost similar in both the cases dear friends it is the cemented cup which makes the difference in the cost so cemented totally definitely is most more cost effective compared to cementless you know uh, totally but not in hemi orthoplasty now, if you see the literature, that this literature shows that uh, there is no difference between you know, all other medical staff, nursing staff, everything, there is no difference. Only the stem cost is there is a higher cost in the cementless prosthesis, but they have not taken into consideration the additional you know, canal restrictor, centralizer, blah, blah, cement, everything into consideration. That adds to the cost and that becomes almost equal with the cementless stem. 
Now, if you this again, this literature, the cost comparison, it shows that this study demonstrates significantly lower operative and anesthetic times and observable cost savings with cementless femoral implants because the period of surgery or the duration of the surgery less in a cementless implant. So indirectly, the cost of the surgery increases for the cemented because of increased operating time, increased anesthetic time, increased manpower and increased operating room times. So that adds to the cost. Hence, you have to look in a broader perspective to see that cemented you know, hips uh, are not uh, that uh, cost effective compared to cementless implants or cementless hip bipolar uh, hip replacement surgeries. Let's consider the comorbid patients. Now, if you see this is a 2020 literature in Acta Orthopedica, perioperative cardiovascular disturbances are less frequent and result in potentially lower early mortality in uncemented hemiarthroplasty. Therefore, uncemented hemiarthroplasty is more appropriate for elderly patients with pre-existing cardiovascular conditions. And they have taken this uh, picture and comorbidity evaluated using usual American Society of Anesthesia or ASA grading. Now let's consider osteoporosis or osteoporotic patients. If you see this, you know, uncemented uh, prosthesis, uh, uncemented bipolar hemiarthroplasty or, uh, you know, hemiarthroplasty, they have taken the cortical thickness index into consideration, where the cortical thickness index average is a 0.49 SG, 0.49. There is no additional late postoperative complications such as loosening, acetabular erosion, and calcar resorption or protrusion acetabuli noted at two years follow. But remember for door type C, you know, canals, I agree with Sanjit and with all I agree with uh, Dr. Suri that it's uh, preferable to do a cemented hip, which also I do in my cases. Now surgical time, as you know, this is our own paper, which Suri quoted and Dr. Maria's paper, where it shows the average surgical time is only 28 minutes. As Sanchi told you, then average, you know, cemented hip cause, you know, takes about 45 minutes. And as you heard, you know, Sancheti sir, that uh, Austin Wood process is finishing in four minutes time. Your friends, the patients with them having comorbidity, the time of surgery is extremely important. There is no dislocation, infection, revision, stem subsidence, acetabular erosion, or acetabular protrusion, and ambulation. All patients are ambulatory at three months post-op. So, Reducing the operating time reduces the cost and also, you know, post-operative morbidity for this kind of patients. So the results of this surgery, again, a Chinese paper that on cement intervention has better outcomes for intraoperative blood loss, systolic blood pressure, surgery duration, length of anesthesia, six months mortality, cardiovascular accidents, respiratory failure, fat embolism, and heterotropic ossification, whatever you tell, the complications are much less in cementless implant. The only thing that about the fractures, intraoperative or postoperative fractures, that requires maturity to handle to prevent a fracture, which is more in uncemented implants. I agree with Sanchit for a change. Now, cemented versus uncemented orthoplasty, again, you see there is increased you know, blood loss in a cemented group because there is increased operating time. And as you know, blood transfusion may lead to that uh, in its own complications like immunomodulation, and that may lead to increased infection during post-operative period. Now, dear friends, you require maturity of cement handling. That is extremely important. Why most of the surgeons are moving to uncemented? Because they are technically, you know, cemented hips are more demanding. And remember, maturity comes with experience and not with age. And hence, one has to be adequately trained in handling the cement in order to achieve that kind of cementing and so that it will have a good long-term outcome. And compared to that cementless hip, more easier to handle. Now let's come to the complications. If you see the complications, more than 12,000 hips, there's increased mortality in day one post-operative among the cemented hips, even after adjustment for age, sex, cognitive impairment, and comorbidity. So perioperative you know, mortality is high in cemented hips. This 74 fatality could have been prevented probably from an uncemented stem. And please remember, death is the most devastating complications occurring during or after the surgery. Now, this is again cemented versus uncemented. Look at the other complications. If you see the deep infection, perioperative death, intraoperative severe decrease in blood pressure and you know preparation of the femoral canal, perioperative myocardial infraction, 
intraoperative cardiac arrest all are higher in the cemented group compared to uncemented though only you know the all other things are almost similar if you see the dislocation pulmonary embolism you know fracture of the contralateral hip etc now this is again eight randomized control trials you know more than 1500 hips the operating time longer in cemented pulmonary embolism calculated is high though others don't show any significant difference and as i admitted before and periposterior fracture is higher in a uncemented implant as described by sanchit as well and the cardiac output during hemiarthroplasty of the hip a prospective control trials reduction in the cardiac output and reduction in the stroke volume and this is a frank stinchfield award clinical orthopedy that sudden death during primary hip arthroplasty though that is 12 in cemented compared to 11 in you know um, uh, uh, in zero in uncemented and the autopsy done so the 11 are methyl methylated particles in the lungs of course nowadays this is a little older paper so now of course they have developed the techniques that how to reduce this uh, to avoid intraoperative complication of same bone cement implantation syndrome the reoperation rate let's see this this shows the almost double reoperation rate in cemented compared to uncemented arthroplasty Uh, so my tips of techniques are doing a uncemented arthroplasty as yes, that i do uncemented uh, you know hemi arthroplasty in dos type a and type b canals the mda score what is known metaphyseal diaphyseal index score which has been developed recently in 2018 that uh, you know take the consideration about from the lesser trochanter under 20 mm high the diameter and 20 mm below the cortical as well as the you know medullary canal diameter and you develop this index a upon c upon b1 plus b2 so mdi score less than or equal to 21 prefer a cemented hemi arthroplasty or else uncemented is the treatment of the choice patients with cardio pulmonary morbidity patients with the asa grade 3 or above i select uncemented hemi arthroplasty in this group of patient but the technique is in uncemented arthroplasty there is a possibility of emboling phenomenon as well so do a lavage of the canal before femoral rimming before broaching and before final insertion of the prosthesis people used to tell don't do lavage in uncemented prosthesis but that is required now in order to prevent a embolic phenomenon and most important what suri told that uh, you have to be technically extremely competent in order to achieve a good long term outcome restore the offset of shape the center of rotation of the hip be it a vertical offset horizontal offset or anterior offset that is antiversion then only your cemented or uncemented it will be a successful and have a long term outcome so this is algorithm just to say that elderly people who are aged more than 65 years with fracture neck femur if the fracture is not displaced then prefer a open reduction or internal fixation like if it is a valgus impacted fracture then you can do a internal fixation but if it is displaced then if the patient has cognitively intact and patient is a community ambulator and has got a good life expectancy then prefer a total hip arthroplasty but if either if cognitively not intact or not a community ambulator or life expectancy is less prefer a hemi arthroplasty and on the hemi arthroplasty group prefer a cemented type if there is a you know dor type c canals only or prefer a cementless if dor type a and b canal associated comorbidity or a sa grade 3 or above and out of which i prefer a bipolar when the expected longevity is beyond 5 years and still i have not thrown austin more out of my basket and i do austin more when the expected longevity is very less maybe 2 to 3 years or less than 5 years and if i have restored the offset my vertical horizontal and anterior offset to the you know to anatomical restoration of the center of rotation then my austin more also last longer now at the end of this fight probably sanchit or me are good friends dear friends you have got what is the indication of a cemented or a non cemented hemi arthroplasty i thank you for a patient hearing and i acknowledge help of dr akhil prabhakar for this lecture thank you very much thank you mohandi sir that was again a great talk with a balance in favor of cemented uncemented stems so do we have a rebuttal from dr sanjit or should we proceed with the panel discussion uh, no i agree that uh, the the slide 
The only thing I would say is what was mentioned earlier, it's a certain expertise. Okay? And sometimes if you want to cut the inventory, if you want one thing that fits all, because we tried to think about keeping the Austin more for the selected cases wherein they were comorbid and cardiovascular function was a bit ropey at best. The problem is those are the tricky cases where you want the operation to go in a predictable fashion. So that's not the operation to experiment with a different implant. So you should stick to what you're comfortable with and I agree with the algorithm that was mentioned by uh, Dr. Mohanty. Absolutely. I mean, that, that is the only difference is that we are not using the Austin Moore anymore. And most of the literature in recent times relates to the modern cementless prosthesis, i.e. the Corai or the Furlong GRI, which are a lot more expensive and have a lot, much higher incidence of intraoperative fractures. Want to sir, any rebuttal from your side? No, fine. You know, I always keep a cemented prosthesis as standby, standby whenever I do a uncemented prosthesis. And uh, as it was told earlier, that you know, whenever there is a intraoperatively you find there is a slightest doubt about the stability of the prosthesis, it's better to go ahead with a you know cemented prosthesis. The added advantage of a cemented prosthesis, of course, you know, you can adjust your uh, um, version as well. And sometimes, you know, an uncemented process is because it fits into the proximal anatomy of the femur. You cannot give much more uh, version. So there is a possibility that intraoperatively you to find that combined, you know, anti-version or a dislocation is, um, you know, it is there is an easy dislocation, better to go for a cemented so that you can adjust the version there in a, especially in a hemiorthoplasty situation. And um, totally, you know, my consensus is that, you know, often you will land up in leg lengthening in case of fracture neck femur because the acetabular side is the mainly responsible for the lengthening of the leg. So these patients are not usually happy after a total hip or a replacement, the fracture neck femur, because are, those patients are absolutely normal before, you know, fracture. And you are imposing some, some kind of, you know, restriction in this kind of patient after the surgery. And because of acetabular replacement, they'll land up in the lengthening. That's why you have to be absolutely technically perfect in order to restore the you know, offset in a total hip as Suri pointed out earlier. So I do cemented, you know, also uncemented also, but in specific indications, I do prefer a cementless processes mm -hmm. in this group of patients. And as I told you, in our country, Austin Moore has got a role still and uh, patients are not affording. And, you know, if they have a very less life expectancy there, I prefer a Austin Moore prosthesis. It's a quick in, quick out without much of comorbidities as well. Thank you. So we'll move ahead with the panel discussion. The first topic I'd like to raise is on decision making between total hip and hemiarthroplasty. So Pachore sir, what is your rationale and when would you choose a total hip versus a hemiarthroplasty? Sir, you have to unmute. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you, Paran. And uh, regards to Dr. Sanchezi and my colleagues. Uh, total hip, what uh, Suri had uh, mentioned, uh, all the uh, things are, I think I totally agree on that. Patient above the age of 65, very active patients, high demand patient. I think uh, there is a good data coming that uh, the hip replacement total hip. Only my worry uh, and uh, important message is the uh, what approach. Suri is a posterior approach and Suri is an excellent surgeon who is able to do it and he will be able to do using a 32 and 36. Of our young population of young surgeons must learn anterolateral approach. Today there is no doubt in the literature anterolateral approach has got the lowest rate of dislocation and it is my request to my young surgeons that they must, as a hip surgeon, they must use different approaches and this is one of the important, important message of this. That is another important thing. Uh, the life experience and patients whose life expectancy, what Suri's paper was said that above age of uh, any age with more than five years life expectancy, I'm for total hip. I'm for total hip replacement. Uh, uh, as far as the Austin Moore was concerned, I hardly do any Austin Moore uh, because I am in now today in the high profile hospital. That is a different phenomenon, but I agree with Mohanty. Some people uh, in the general hospital will require Austin Moore, but I think it's not a good process. Good processes. Very rarely it works 
and we just see often this is my 20 year result 10 year result but if you look at the whole data i think our stream should not be should not be there are large number of papers coming uh, because in our country we don't have enough data of their long term follow up so i think i do only austin more when patient is not mobile not mobile he is in the bed because of neurological any problem and he has a fractured neck femur i'll just put austin because he is going to survive only for 3 months or 6 months otherwise i will not use an austin more at all at all and uh, suri was um, uh, sorry uh, uh, monty was talking about limb length i think all fractured neck femur 1 cm half cm going to be limb length not because of vestibular not be mainly because you are increasing the soft tissue tension this is a virgin capsule that is the biggest problem with a limb length with this patient but you increase by uh, half cm 1 cm is good for you because uh, stability you achieve a little bit of better stability thank you sir joshi sir your rational on decision making between total versus hemi i agree that uh, ultimately it depends upon how active the patient is and the longevity of the patient now that longevity of the patient i am a little uh, not very although my name is joshi i don't know how much they would to live so i say that if he is otherwise active and moving around then i'd go for a total hip otherwise i'll go for a partial hip Uh, as Dr. Pachor has said that for very elderly patients who are practically on bed, he said that he would probably put a Gostin Moore. I would, in such cases, probably prefer to do nothing. I just probably put a Depo-Meteral inside his hip joint, make him reasonably pain-free, move that joint again and again, and within a week's time, they are reasonably comfortable and they can do whatever they want to do with that. Because doing any surgical procedure, I am not really going to help him any which way. Plus, I am putting in an implant. A surgical intervention itself has its own problems of infection and other things. I do not like to subject them to that. I leave them, tell them, take him home, and be comfortable with whatever way you can. But yes, an ambulatory patient who more than demand if he's ambulatory, and of course every patient wants to move around, and he's doing well, then a total hip is a better option, and maybe a dual mobility in majority of the cases would do the trick. Um. Suri sir, you spoke about the dislocation rates and stability in total hip for fracture neck femurs. So, what are your indications for enhancing the stability? Do you prefer dual mobility any time, or when would you use an elevated liner? And intraoperatively, can you tell us about how your method for stability testing after the procedure? Yeah, I think this is one of the crucial elements. Should you decide to do a total hip in these cases? Uh, what is important basically like i said uh, before was enhancing the stability again your three options today i think you should shoot for a larger head as much as possible the dual mobility is not a routine for all the cases after all for decades we have used only a 22 or a 28 head and still we have got the stability focus on three things one i think uh, important in the women especially as it is that issues are lax and the second thing is trauma like dr pachore mentioned as a subsequent capsular expansion leads to lax soft tissues so if your end point for assessing the stability is going to be the shock test you are gone i think you are going to lengthen quite a bit more so i think that is not even on a regular basis the shock test is very very fallacious to be interpreted unless you are used to because what force you apply is what determines a frail lady and a huge force it's going to open up so that is avoidable second thing what you need to do is basically a positional stability of the head then stick to the anatomical landmarks if it is non pathologic like the cup the virgin inclination probably you could update the cup to about a little more on the around the 30 or 35 if you are very concerned and then on the uh, uh, give the same amount of uh, appropriate uh, anti virgin on the femoral stem capsular closure is my main key what we have been modifying in this when we do posture today is to retain the piriformis and some of the superior lateral rotators the advantage of keeping them intact and trying to get is that uh, one one that that will prevent you from excessively offloading and getting a uh, offset more on a lateral because if you tend to increase a horizontal off especially in the short stocky ladies you find that they do come back with a trochanteric pain to avoid this you can have anatomical structure second is during your trial I'll, you take the pre-placed sutures and make sure you are able to get the whole rotator complex which you have released, capsular ligamentous thing, onto the trochanteric fossa. 
If you need force or if you need excessive external rotation to get the tissues, then there is something wrong. So I think you should fine tune this a couple of times to make sure you are doing the right thing. I would not want or use. I usually do not use the extended liners because I think uh, they sometimes could be impinging and counterproductive. I think it is best avoided. As it is, the joint is going to be lax because the tissues. And you give sort of a fulcrum by adding the extended liner. I think that is going to be more detrimental. Probably you should get the appropriate position with the standard neutral liners. But only focus on try to getting a larger head. If the cup is extremely small and if you are very doubtful, and probably then a dual mobility may be. Uh, an option today, but factor the cost factorials that also come. But every case where there is a cognitive dysfunction or the local neuromuscular issue, a little bit where you want to do, probably ideal would be a bipolar because you automatically get a large head. But if you can't for some other reason, you are going to put a total hip, probably a dual mobility may be a good option in these cases. Mohanty, sir, any additional points from your side on the previous two questions? In addition to you know Suri's comments, I would add that while exposing, I would avoid you know uh, releasing the gluteus maximus attachment, particularly in fracture neck femur patients, because that is the point where if you release that, then you will end up in the lengthening. Right. And Suri told about piriformis also. So, but I usually sacrifice the piriformis, but nowadays people are, you know, um, uh, shaving the piriformis in order to prevent, uh, you know, um, uh, the post-operative function is outcome is much better if you keep the piriformis. So this is one case, number one, that uh, don't sacrifice or don't, you know, release the gluteus maximus. You can get a good exposure because there are fracture neck femur and your capsule is lax, so there won't be any problem. It is usually required in the arthritic hips where the structures are tight. Number two, intraoperative stability tests I do. Normally, suppose I do a total hip, I put the cup there, I put a trial line or there, I do the intraoperative stability. Though, you know, sock test uh, is a rough, you know, estimate just to show the stability in case of fracture neck femur, but if it is more than a millimeter or so, then you have to be a little concerned about that. Then I do flexion, abduction, you know, external rotation. I should get about, you know, 40 to 45 degree external rotation without any dislocation. Number two, flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. I should be able to you know, do about 60 degree of internal rotation on the table without a dislocation. And I do abduction to look for the whether the greater term greater trochanter is impinging upon the superior aspect of the acetabulum leading to inter dislocation. Can I add one thing? Combined antiversion. Finish the combined antiversion described at 15 degree flexion and, uh, you know, come 40 to 45 degree, you know, possible. And uh, last but not the least, look for the, you know, soft tissue structures like overstressed and all those are more important in arthritic hips, but not uh, in the, you know, uh, fracture neck femur. And last is the limb lengthening. Uh, as you put go by Ranavat's method and Suri goes by that suture uh, method. So you put the stimen pin, you know, in the infracortiloid notch and uh, check for that you are not lengthening much. That, uh, that is my take on that. But while doing a bipolar hemiarthroplasty, then I check for the, you know, restoration of the center of rotation is more, you know, important compared to the opposite hip, like your uh, vertical offset, horizontal offset, as well as the version. And as I told earlier, in case of, uh, you know, uncemented hips, if you find that my version is not going correct because, because the, you know, tight fitting, it matches the proximal anatomy of the femur, I may prefer to go for a cemented in order to give little extra anti-version there in cases of bipolar hemiarthroplasty. Suri, sir, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just want to, again, just reaffirm what Dr. Pachari was mentioning. I think it is time that we all also use the anterior approach. It is, I think, obvious and offsets so many other issues of the posterior side. It's okay because we have been doing it time immemorial. We are able to get the things sort of in the ballpark when you do the posterior. But the anterior approach probably is much more elegant, especially in the trauma situations. And it is not a time. I think one could master it and use it in these situations. Well, closure, one thing. Yeah, yeah, Pacharya, sir. 
Can I? Uh, Suri was talking about dual mobility. I think uh, it should not be done for a routine. I agree with Suri. These are the patients who are on the high risk patients. I think you should reserve that double mobility cup because of the uh, cost and other things. Uh, other things because especially for Parkinson, other other conditions. Then that is the patients who are high dislocated chances of their alcoholic. All these patients are okay for that, but not for a routine use. Uh, routine use. If you are going to put 32, 36, and that is, uh, I think uh, that should be that should not be worry for uh, using a double mobility car. Regarding you know the soft tissue closure in a postural approach or postural lateral approach, the capsule and the rotator should be taken together and <clears throat> you know sutured through the first aspect of the greater trochanter through pull through suture that is number 1 number 2 the you know the abductor rotator interval superiorly the abductor rotator interval there should be a suture one or two sutures you know there and number 3 if you have released you know gluteus maximus partially at least then you suture that back there are the three important points and number 4 if possible i also i close the greater trochanter bursa over this so that is a good complete layer of uh, you know soft tissue structure which I close before closing the deep passer. Dr. Sanchit, any additional points from your side? Uh, no, uh, agree with all that has been mentioned. I think that I would stress the importance of robustly challenging it intraoperatively. And if it's unstable on table, it's not going to miraculously stabilize afterwards. And just a word of caution about dual mobility as has been mentioned, the National Joint Registry data that is coming through now is showing a lot of problems with the dual mobility hip replacements. So it's not a panacea that come sort of for everyone. It's not the solution. Challenging it intraoperatively, meticulous surgical technique is probably the better option. Okay. Uh, Sanchet, can I ask you some question? Yes, sir. Sanchet, can yeah. I ask you something? Yeah. When you say that you are not going to do, which is the patient you are not going to do cemented, cemented uh, stem, have you got any contraindication? No. I would do a cemented stem for everything. The only thing I would change is I would change the amount of pressurization I would do when I would do a cemented stem if the patient is comorbid. Because the data from all across, I've been uh, reading and I've been, uh, I, you know that I've been also cemented men for almost 40 years. So uh, the things are, which are worrying us, I did had one or two patients recently also had a uh, bone uh, implantation syndrome. Syndrome. I lost a patient, one patient. I lost. That is all right. But uh, my are we now concern for all of you is when you want to do this cemented, I think your anesthetic should be very good. There are certain things which have come with from the British Orthopedic Association, <clears throat> British anesthesiologist. Uh, it has come that how you can minimize. There are steps they have given one, two, three steps. Uh, I would not do a patient who has got cardiac function less than 30 to 40 percent, patient who has got valvular disease, patient who has got aortic incompetence, aortic incompetence, and very high morbid, morbid patient. I think I should not uh, do this. And secondly, I would not, as I agreed, I would not pressurize uh, the cement too much. Just get a lousy cement and just get on, get on. Uh, this is the thing which uh, I just, and anesthetist has to be extremely careful. I think there are certain things which I am not going to go into details, but uh, this is very important for as far as this elderly population, these high risk patients are concerned. I would not do a, a cemented, cemented stem. So, uh, just to come, uh, what we do is uh, on the basis of Coventry um, started this cement timeout. So, and we have a shout before you grout. So, you yeah, let yeah. them just know. And then, uh, like uh, Dr. Dr. Pacharya sir described that there are a few things. In fact, if you want, I've got a slide with precisely that information. Uh, if I just bring that up. So those are the instructions for the anesthetist to then shout before you grout and then they maintain the blood pressure, use metaraminol if necessary, keep the patient hydrated, and that keeps the bone cement implantation syndrome effect to the minimum. That's what we use. Hi, I, so I've seen this. Uh, this is from British uh, Orthopedic and British Anesthesiologist. So the British, yeah, Journal yeah, of Anesthesiology. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
I am aware of that. One more thing, I agree with Dr. Joshi that in uh, you know bedridden patients, uh, I would not operate uh, the patients because if you if have seen that uh, you know most of the even uh, fracture neck femur patients gradually they become painless you know over a certain period of time gradually the head gets absorbed and you know the painless even some ambulatory patients you have seen those who have neglected they don't have much of pain they have limping they walk with certain kind of support or something like that but uh, they become painless over a period of time in especially transcervical fracture neck femur patients uh, i do not agree both of you but today we are in 2020 this was done when i was houseman and registrar today it is just not allowed because if you just do a, a surgery only for the pain and nursing nothing more my dear and today the anesthesia in other than your department is so good mohanty you don't think of this condition that putting an injection inside and giving them a valve and then they are very painless after some time but they had to go for at least 3 to 6 weeks of misery and how do you do nursing of these patients so you do a quick surgery get out and at least you have nursing and bed sore and other thing can be avoided i do it that was i am talking about when i was half sober uh, suri can i ask something we <laughs> agree to this agree sir <laughs> yes sir suri uh, there is a, there was one or two papers stating this fracture neck femur patients have a abducted tendinitis and disruption disruption as a reported with very high incidence have you seen them because i have seen only two or three i had to repair primarily have you seen them and especially if you see a pre op x ray if there is a slight calcif they are like a rotator cuff if there is a slight calcification on the greater trochanter you must suspect that this patient has got abductor uh, tendinitis and likely to get disturbed i done two repairs and i went through the literature and prepared some uh, yeah, slides and the reported rate is very high have have anybody have seen this monty or uh, i have seen sir i have seen one patient who operated he was operated uh, elsewhere but after 3 months uh, he presented to me it's a nicely done cemented total hip replacement for fracture neck femur but he has got you know limping and he has abductor lurch and uh, when i saw his active abduction was painful and uh, when i measured the offset the surgeon has increased the offset uh, compared to opposite side i thought probably it is uh, you know because of the increased offset that he is getting this abductor lurch and the pain and the over the greater trochanter but uh, i have i didn't do anything for that patient just uh, i gave a local you know steroid injection there but still the patient is unhappy about it but uh, i can't do anything else or other than you know revising or reducing upset which will be a pretty difficult job yeah, uh, yeah. unless you do anything better only one patient i have seen that's all yes go ahead the only aberration i was going to mention was that uh, certainly in the uk we use the direct lateral approach or the hardinge type approach for hemiarthroplasties but for our total hip replacements we go back to the posterior approach so i think the approach whichever you are comfortable with uh, and the surgical technique will make a difference as regards abductor dysfunction i agree because of stability there's always a tendency to almost overstuff it and increase the offset and that probably contributes to that abductor dysfunction can i yes, come sahil yes sir uh, i just wanted to just generate a little bit of talk about the stem and the types of stem if non cement and we use it on cemented what has been the thing is mostly in the proximal femur you find the bone fairly cancelized especially in the elderly and trying to use only the dual taper blades sometimes uh, doesn't give you that amount of a fair fit on the ap dimension so in a bigger center if you have access to all types of stems then it becomes easier to shift you know because depending upon the diameter and the size of the stem the proximal profile also tends to change for example i mean if you use uh, the striker accolades or the corals they are only uh, ml uh, medial lateral ap i think they are pretty poor and you don't get that degree of a robust rotational fixation so dr pachori i think our uh, mohanty how do you choose your stem or do you have two options or do you work with only one type i mean this is a dilemma we have seen for example yeah. the polar stems are a little more robust 
if you go on the AP as you study, you can check the diameter and the dimensions. They give you a slightly better fit in the proximal metaphysical areas. So that you have- I, I agree, Suri, with you. That's the reason. Luckily, I have a, I had option because of the high volume center. So I depends on the what type of canal I have. And I always have a one stem, as a cemented stem stand by always, always. And I had an opportunity at least a couple of times to, uh, because I could not get the stability even at the 16 of uh, Korel also. So most of the elderly population, sorry, I agree, it is rather than double taper, I will like to use a fully coated stem, fully coated stem that is much better, much better stem as far as this is concerned. Most of the time I use coral stem, fully coated coral stem, which has yeah. got a very good long-term outcome in the literature. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so as I told you, if there is a you know problem uh, about this AP problem, then I prefer to shift uh, to a cemented type uh, in that case, because cemented stem, uh, you know, on the femoral side, cementing technique is a good reproducible technique, and it has got a good long-term outcome compared to on the vestibular side. So Dr. Sanchit is saying, why not cement it in all the cases, correct? No, no, I was, I was, <laughs> that is my standard. Uh, <laughs> but the question I was going to ask actually is because here we've moved to the collared korai. Are, are you using collared korai or collarless? Collarless. We have, we have got both available, but most of us are using uh, without collar. Uh, without collar. Because that collared cora is supposed to give some insurance against yeah, subsidence. Yeah, yeah, stability. I agree, I agree. Where in these patients. Uh, but I think you have to depend on primary stability rather than a collar. Collar will uh, may avoid a little bit of sinkage here and there, but it is not going to be the primary stabilizing force uh, as far as we are concerned. Concern. Yeah, too deep in with collarless to visit, revisit the collared. I think at this mm -hmm. time. To get I that feeling. There are some reports on the fracture neck femur actually, collar prosthesis on coral are done better than the uh, uncemented, uh, no, without collar. I agree with uh, Sanjit. Yeah. A quick verdict on um, bearing surface of choice for total hip in fracture neck femur. Pachare, sir. Yes, uh, and the elderly population, I am not worried. I am using, I, I can use highly cross poly, and uh, even a metal doesn't matter. But Suri is uh, mainly a man uh, that he is worried about the treninosis, and he is uh, he has shifted to a, he has shifted to a ceramic head. But I don't think these are elderly population. They are very that that high demand. I can use whatever the what the pocket of the patient is. But I think uh, uh, my choice is uh, not on ceramic ceramic, but it is on highly cross poly and uh, metal or maybe ceramic. Ceramic. Yeah, that was a unit policy for us, which we took about six years ago when the cleanliness was at high. But then in the elderly, in the intertrochanthic, we still probably would do oxygenum is something in between which can work. On the acetabular side, of course, it's a cross poly. On the femoral side, even at for worst, if the metal works, metal will work equally well. I'm not really worried in this situation because these are not extremely high demand, high mobile individuals. Yeah, mobile patients. So there needs to be a big debate about the bearing. Metal on plastic will work equally well. Mohanty, sir. Ceramic and polyethylene preferable. Only thing is the if the patient has cost constraint, then I use metal on polyethylene. Dr. Sanjay. Highly costing poly. Uh, ceramic on poly. Again, if we are talking about the selected patient who has high activity level and long survivorship, then ceramic on poly is uh, default. Joshi, sir. Ceramic on poly. So, um, on hemiarthroplasty, um, when would you prefer, what is your verdict on cemented and uncemented, Pachare, sir? Uh, most of the time, uh, hemiarthroplasty is, uh, most of the time is uh, un uncemented uh, hemiarthroplasty. Unfortunately, you, the, uh, in India, we don't have the good stem, what uh, the, the Sahit was talking, uh, Sanchet was, Sanchet was talking that we don't have the modern uh, modern stem of modularity. That is the biggest problem with uh, us. us. Uh, but if you want, I'm actually, more, most of the, my is uh, bipolars, uh, bi uncemented bipolar, that is my choice actually, which has been using, and we do have a large series of our patients and we did a follow-up follow -up of them on a long time. So I just uh, only hemi orthoplasty like Austin Moore, I don't do it, which I already told you. So my choice is most of the time uncemented, uh, uncemented bipolar, and I have two or three stems available. Depend on the quality of the quality of the bone and what stability I get. 
And so what would you tell your patient? What is the longevity of a hemiarthroplasty? When... See, the hemiarthroplasty, uh, our data itself has uh, shown, uh, uh, we looked at uh, our hemiarthroplasty, 150 patients with a follow-up of one or maybe two years or so. And, uh, you know, nine or 10% of the patients have died. That is a one-year mortality is that, and everybody knows that mortality is such a high. Fortunately, this was low mortality because of our high volume and multi-speciality, multi, otherwise it is almost 20 to 30%. So we, can, we can't just give a, a rough estimate, but depends on what is the comorbidity of the patient. So it is very, very difficult to say that this is the patient who's going to, going to survive for 10 years and five years. It is not possible to give them. So I think depends on the uh, depends on his mor morbidity morbidity of the patient. Doshi sir, your verdict on cemented and uncemented? Yeah, I'll start with the uncemented. And as everybody had said that you have to get a very good primary fixation. If your fixation is dubious any which way, immediately I'll turn over and do a cemented. I won't wait. I won't dabble with it saying that it is going to get stabilized on its own, which it is never going to get stabilized. As far as the longevity of the thing is concerned, it's again very, very difficult to really predict how much longevity they will have. By and far, I think about between 8 to 10 years, it would last. What happens is some of the patients, even in young patients in say around 60s, they want, because of financial reasons, a partial hip replacement. And then at times you have to convince them that probably in that we can do it but if it doesn't last then you're going to go for a total hip and that's going to be a little bit more expensive in the long run the expense is something which if you discuss with the patient probably they would agree and then you can probably do a metal poly if required but leaving it with a partial hip in a patient who would do better with a total hip i'm not very comfortable doing it not more than 10 years by and far within that time frame it does get rubbed out that's what i've seen Suri, sir, your take on cemented and uncemented and longevity of a hemi. So you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, by choice, because of the uncemented being used in higher numbers so all the time, we prefer to get it uncemented. But there is no hesitation to do a cemented at any point in time. And one of the, my colleagues also is well trained. We are used to it. After the first 15, 20 years, we did only cemented hips and then slowly moved out. Like I said, bearing remains, um, I think it's a cross link poly, ceramic on, on the functional levels or a metal is not an issue. Uh, but in terms of longevity, it's very difficult to put a number to it because we really truly have not followed up. A lot depends upon the morbidity, the comorbidities of the patients and the activity levels. So average household lady is just looking after personally by themselves. I think they outlive most of the time. So once uh, for one first one, two years, if they are crossed, and then they then continue uneventfully for quite some time to come. But if they have a very stormy first year, then anticipate trouble for failure, but which is again a very small percentage. Like Dr. Pachori mentioned, I think it's the one year mortality and the three year mortality, not even five years. I think we have to look at it, especially when you cross a 70 age barrier. 60 to 70, I think uh, they would do well. Probably tendency would be more towards a total in these cases uh, if they are physically very active. Okay. Just a last question because we'll have to wrap up due to constraint of time. Monty, sir, since you spoke about uncemented stems, you said in door type C, you will still do cemented. So when you have a door type C femur, would you still go in and attempt an uncemented first or you straight away want to do a cemented? Usually I straight away go for a cemented in a door type C. Okay. Whenever you see the osteoporotic bone and uh, you should not waste time on the table and uh, do a cemented. And regarding cemented, uncemented, you know, most of the surgeons in our country are not doing cemented. That is because it or technically it is more demanding to achieve a good cement mantle around the stem, achieve a good, you know, bone cement, you know, interlock or, uh, you know, micro interlock is a technique which is needs to be done. Most of our young generation surgeons, they don't learn that from the beginning. That's why they have got a fear of, you know, cementing and uh, theater temperature, of course, blah, blah. There are so many other things. That's why they prefer uncemented. Otherwise, you know, if you're a good technique, both cemented and uncemented will have a good long-term outcome. Besides, you know, of course, the comorbidity and uh, ASA grade three and above, those are the you know, specialized cases. 
and uh, for my patients if i have done a total hip i give them a longevity of about say 15 to 20 years but when i do a hemi arthroplasty i tell about 8 to 10 years but one important point one must remember i never tell the patient that the bipolar prosthesis will be can be converted to a total hip never ever i tell that that is extremely important because that is what is you know written in the literature one advantage because we don't know while revising that what will be the status of this time that time you know patient may tell you that uh, you are told that uh, it can be revised to totally keeping the stem intact so that is the situation at that time one need to evaluate and uh, do it uh, from case to case right any additional questions from our uh, faculty that they would like to raise pachori sir suri sir anything additional from your side and i think the devil is in the details with regard to the survival of the prosthesis when you do cementing is a real art it is not that as a surgeon alone is enough your staff around the oa should be primed for the whole thing and i think it requires much more effort on the uncemented side your intuitive sense of what is stable and how to achieve the stability should have been something which should have reproduced hundreds of cases on the routine hips once you do that and you have the option of some sort of a trade off now if there is a problem to shift to seamless to shift to one would be a better way to go but both the sides you know cemented or uncemented technique i think that is a, will be the way to go and then appropriate sizing and all the other factors like i said here don't take a unique uh, hemi as being just a hemi or a austrian mur or something you have to rehearse and do all the steps what you do for the total i think every step needs to be reproduced what you do then i think It, uh, it can probably predictably give a good outcome. Right. Sorry. Pachari, can I have half a minute? Yes, sir. Sure, sure. This is one of the fantastic theses has come on the, from the Swedish registry to me just about few days back, and this was the only thesis on fracture neck displaced fracture neck femur. So let me just read a summary of this of this gentleman who did a fantastic work. Number one, THR is the treatment of choice for displaced fracture neck femur in a healthy, lucid, elderly, and good preoperative hip function. That is number one. Number two, uncemented stem must be avoided in patient older than 65 years. 65 years. That was the data. Third, THR yields no benefit over H, uh, on hemiarthroplasty in ectogenic and non non organic uh, patients. And lastly. Hemiarthroplasty is safe option in patient with dementia and cognitive dysfunctions and cognitive dysfunction. That was the uh, study which was coming just recently from the Swedish uh, Swedish data. Thank you, sir. Joshi, sir, you wanted to say something. I just wanted to ask that: uh, Is there any specific movement you would restrict the patients after hemiarthroplasty, or you allow them whatever they can do once it is done? Like okay, squatting or that. sitting down on the floor, all those activities, you would still allow them, or you would restrict them? Uh, to be frank, in a private setup of ours, I think we will just very clearly. I at least mention that these are the things you can't do it. But certain people go and do it. That is, that is, uh, no, you are not going to see them. <laughs> you are not going to see them. But I just what I gave them a fear is if you do that. your last joint will not last for longer time it will be much wear and you will start have a problem that is the fear i create within within them to be frank but i last two years i have been doing some anterior lateral approach but i now there are no precautions for anterior lateral approach as far as i am concerned concerned so uh, that is the only one uh, greatest advantage which uh, last two three years well i was like a suri post op surgeon but last three years i have shifted to anterior lateral approach for uh, these are the ca for cases So no precautions, absolutely. So so for and posterior, touch wood, no precautions. And touch wood last three years says there is only one dislocation which has occurred. <laughs> so and for posterior, what were your precautions that you would advise? Yes, posterior, I I uh, didn't allow them to sit immediately, uh, keeping the uh, proper rotation uh, rotation all the time, all the time, and not to adduct the limb, not to flex the limb during the first five to ten days, all sorts of things. You know, keeping a pillow in between. So I my my until I approach if I do operate in the in the evening they start walking or my if I operate in the afternoon they will start in the next day morning next day morning and they sit also uh, you see in the morning round they are on the uh, sitting on the coffee coffee table and having their paper newspaper in their hand that what we want to see. 
Sorry, sir. You'll have to unmute yourself. No limitations. They are up the same evening, if it is possible. I just leave them because patients don't listen to you. You don't know what they are doing in the night. <laughs> Focus on keeping things secure, reattach the tissues properly. Uh, I think Mohanty very nicely mentioned about even closing the superior lateral interval. Close up all this, get the right things, and then let them leave them alone. They will do it. If it hurts, they will stop. Mohanty, sir, your restrictions post-operatively? Yeah, I agree with um, Pachare, sir. What uh, we tell the patient that avoid all these ground level activities that will lead to more wear. And if to more wear, you may require a revision surgery early compared to people who are you know, doing it. But having said that, as uh, Suri told, many patients they do. And when they come for follow up, you see that they are doing, they are sitting, able to sit cross legged, they are you know, squatting also. So it depends basically, you know, in your in a totally how anatomically you have put your acetabulum that decides about this even you know one patient i had 28 size cemented totally replacement both acetabular side and uh, femoral side he is squatting for the last six years and you know doing his uh, you know um, uh, his toiletry activities in squatting he was doing but it is by chance not by choice mm -hmm. so he took his picture took his x-ray and we saw the x-ray in the squatting position there is no impingement whatsoever that is how they are you know sustained this is because of the probably a good you know soft tissue closure and no impingement which has led to to do these activities dr sanjit your precautions so for hemiaplasty no precautions for total hip replacements for the first 6 weeks we ask them to go slowly but thereafter no restrictions having said that we don't have the problem of squatting mm -hmm. yeah hmm. right so, so you don't you have an asian population there <laughs> <laughs> But, but they must not be squatting there. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for your valuable time. That was a great webinar. And I'm sure our viewers have a lot of take-home messages that they can follow in the practice as well and hopefully have better outcomes for their patients. Thank you. And I think we can stop going live now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.